Okay, uh, so uh, hello, welcome to my talk. Uh, my talk is uh, devoted to the volumes of uh, sections of the cube. So let's start. Uh, first, uh, let me introduce the problem. Uh, there will be three main characters on the stage. Uh, the n-dimensional cube, uh, a k-dimensional subspace H of Rn and their intersection. So here's the picture. You may see a uh, three-dimensional cube and uh, two-dimensional subspace, which uh, intersects, uh, which crosses uh, the the origin, and uh, the intersection of uh, of the plane uh, with the three cube is this uh, brown uh, hexagon. So, uh, what uh, may we ask about the intersection? Namely, uh, let's uh, let's compute its volume. What can we say about its volume? Like, uh, what are the uh, external values of uh, the volume of the section, and uh, where are they attained at? So. Uh, this problem have, has been studied intensively, as well as the problem of finding the external values of uh, the volume of the projections of uh, the cross polytop, the cube, the uh, some other uh, convex uh, central symmetric bodies in Rn onto the k-dimensional subspaces. And the uh, classical results are as follows, for example, uh, Weiler's uh, theorem uh, in seventy uh, nine, uh, which says that uh, the only mix, uh, the only minimizers of uh, the volume of uh, the section of the cube uh, is uh, the volume of k dimensional cube, and uh, this volume is uh, uh, attained on k dimensional coordinate subspaces. Uh, it was about uh, the minimum value of uh, the volume. What about the maximal value? Oh, uh, of course, I forgot to say uh, how Valer uh, obtained the result. He used uh, the notion of uh, the pickedness of measures. Uh, you can compare two measures. You can say that one is more picked than the other if uh, some geometrical condition follows. And he also used the, 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 the notion of uh, log concave measures. Uh, about the uh, maximal value of uh, the volume. Uh, this well-known uh, Ball's theorem from 89. Uh, he derived uh, two upper bounds, like uh, you may see on the slide, uh, that are, however, not tied. Uh, the first one is tied whether uh, k divides n and and only in this case, uh, this uh, upper bound is tied. And the uh, second upper bound is tied whether uh, 2k is at least n. Uh, to, in order to prove it, uh, Ball used the brass complete inequality and also for, for the first uh, upper bound. And uh, uh, the Fourier transform for to obtain the uh, the second uh, upper bound. So, uh, what is our aim? We are looking for the tight upper bound for uh, the volume of the section uh, for uh, any case, like not only when uh, k divides n, we want the tight upper bound for uh, for each k and for each n. So, where do we start? Uh, what are we going to do? First, we start with an observation that uh, the only known maximizers of uh, the volume of the section, they are all affine cubes. Uh, it was shown uh, by, uh, actually, Ball doesn't say anything about that in his article. But nevertheless, uh, the only known maximizers are affine cubes. Uh, so our brave thought is uh, that the maximizer actually is an affine cube. Uh, 
Now uh, let's uh, define the constant C cube uh, and uh, let C cube NK uh, volume of K dimensional cube be uh, the maximal volume of the section among all the sections that are affine cubes. The conjecture is as follows. We said that it is uh, the maximal section, the maximal volume uh, section among all the sections. And we also say that this upper bound is tight. And it is attained uh, whether the section is an affine cube. Uh, this constant C cube, uh, it is easy to uh, obtain its, uh, its value for uh, every N and every K. It's uh, not a uh, hard geometry at all. So let's go further. What are our results uh, in this field? So uh, the conjecture uh, from the slide was proven for uh, the planar case, uh, whether k uh, equals two. And uh, it means that the area of uh, the planar section is at most uh, this value and uh, it is attained uh, if the section is a rectangle with the uh, sides of this length and uh, I'll try my best to uh, explain uh, the proof of this case in the end of my talk. Also uh, I'll try to show that uh, whether uh, uh, vector v is a projection of uh, vector of standard bias of r n onto a dimensional subspace, then the square uh, of its length is uh, bounded with these two values. And I'll explain uh, why uh, actually we should think of projections of vectors on uh, a k dimensional subspace. Uh, also, uh, I'll say something about uh, the, con the local conditions, the condition uh, for the local maximizer of uh, this problem. Uh, they are as follows. Uh, the, such a hyperplane uh, meets uh, the, the polytope that uh, is a section of the cube in its facet. Uh, and uh, this line means the this face in its centroid and uh, uh, this uh, this equation may be scary but uh, further i will explain what it all means so also uh ivanov in his uh, um, 2080 paper uh, described uh, all these subspaces such that the volume i was talking about is attained and uh, they are given by the following rule. I will not uh, pay your attention uh, for this slide uh, because it's not of the great importance in this talk. So uh, let's go further. Uh, one of uh, the key observations, uh, I would like emphasize three main observations in this uh, whole uh, in this whole paper. Uh, the first of it, uh, the first uh, observation is uh, that we reformulate the problem in uh, more suitable terms. Uh, and uh, to do this, like, wash the hands. What is a cube actually? A cube uh, is uh, uh, like, it is Cartesian product of uh, the segment minus one, one, uh, n times. But geometrically, uh, it, it may be considered as uh, an intersections, uh, as uh, the intersection of uh, the slabs of such a form. Uh, it is clear from the very uh, definition of uh, the n cube. What's a section? A section, uh, like that appeared on the screen. Uh, is given by this uh, by this expression. Let me explain what it all uh, leads to. Like, uh, let's project uh, the basis vectors on uh, onto the subspace we just 
drone and uh, what do we get? We see that uh, since uh, the scalar product ignores the orthogonal component of uh, the basis vector, uh, this scalar product equals to this scalar product. And it means that it means that the only thing you should care about while talking about uh, the sections of the cube is the uh, is the projection of uh, your basis of Rn onto these onto the subspace. That's the conclusion we have uh, came up with. So the section of the cube is just the intersection of uh, the slabs of this form. Namely, uh, let me draw something. You have a vector, uh, say, E1, that is projected onto the subspace H. And, uh, uh, oh, this, this is a mess uh, with colors. I'm sorry, it should be like this. And uh, uh, what do I mean? I mean that you've got a vector V1 uh, and uh, a slab of this form. It's like, it's, it's something like this. Uh, also, you've got uh, more vectors that give uh, some more slabs like this. And uh, what do you uh, get? And what you get as an as the intersection of the slabs is actually your section, uh, the section of the cube. Let's go further. Um, so uh, we see that uh, in the in our problem, uh, the only thing that we should be concerned. Uh, the only thing we should care about uh, it's not the subspace uh, that we uh, that intersects the cube it's uh, the projection of uh, the orthonormal basis of the standard orthonormal basis onto this onto this subspace so uh, let us uh, explore the nature of uh, the projections of of uh, of basis of Rn onto subspaces. What do we see? Ivanov proved the following lemma, that uh, if you have uh, an orthonormal basis of Rn, and, uh, well, namely, sorry, uh, if you have uh, a set of vectors in your k-dimensional space, uh, you uh, actually uh, can treat it also as uh, the set of vectors in RK that possesses uh, this very property. Well, uh, I want to say that uh, if you got vectors V1, uh, Vn in RK, and you know that they uh, are obtained as the projection of some of the normal basis, they also satisfy uh, this equation and uh, backwards. Here's a reminder uh, of what is a tensor product of vectors in case you uh, never knew. It's just like a projection. It's an operator of uh, projection onto the direction uh, of the vector V with some coefficient. Uh, why the lemma is true? Well, uh, from the, uh, in this direction, from one to two, it's, uh, it's completely straightforward. You just use uh, simple calculations to see that it is actually true. Uh, in backwards, uh, if you have uh, such k-dimensional vectors, such n k-dimensional vectors that uh, satisfy this condition, uh, you see that uh, the such matrix is uh, a submatrix of an orthogonal matrix and the rest follows. You may have seen this expression uh, while you studied uh, John's theorem, famous John's theorem uh, about the John ellipsoid. Uh, this expression appears there as well. 
And uh, this will be a set of vectors that possess this property uh, will be our main tool. Let's give us the, uh, the main definition. We said that uh, the end tuple uh, of vectors in uh, finite dimensional space is a tight frame in this space. If uh, the following equation holds, if the sum of uh, their uh, tensor squares equals uh, the identity operator on uh, this space. Uh, the object of study is, uh, uh, the objects of study are uh, tight frames in RK. There's a mistake, this should be not N, but K. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will study uh, the set of n vectors, uh, the n tuples of n vectors in RK uh, such that they are tight frames. Let's go further. Let me introduce some more machinery uh, in order to show you that uh, uh, the reformulation of our problem is legal uh, and works. Uh, for uh, the set of vectors S uh, tilde in RK, uh, let's define such an intersection, which is actually uh, a, a convex uh, central symmetric polytope in RK. Namely, you have, like, say, let me draw this. Again, you've got, like, say, uh, this vector, this vector, and uh, this vector in your uh, set S tilde, V1, V2, V3. And uh, for each vector, you draw uh, the slab of this form. And something like this. And what you get uh, as intersections, as, as the intersection of uh, these three slabs, is your convex polytope. Uh, we will study the volume of uh, such intersections. Compare it with uh, what you've seen before. You've seen before uh, almost the same sets and uh, almost the same function of volume. Like what I want to say, the reformulation of uh, the problem is as follows. Uh, the original problem of uh, maximizing this function, this uh, the first function, it is connected with uh, the uh, manifold, the with the Grassmannian manifold. It's a, a manifold of uh, high, very high dimension, and uh, you've got to maximize uh, a function defined on this manifold. It is hard. It's like very like high level uh, differential geometry, and uh, it's not very intuitive, I say. But uh, if you study uh, instead of uh, the function on the manifold, you can study uh, the function defined on the set of tight frames in R K, and uh, it appears that these two problems are equivalent. So yes, these problems coincide uh, in the sense that uh, given a subspace H, you can always uh, project your uh, basis onto this subspace and uh, you obtain tight frame and the, and the section uh, generated by this tight frame is exactly uh, the section you have dealt before. And, uh, vice versa, given a tight frame, you can reconstruct a subspace uh, in such a way that, uh, uh, that uh, the projection onto uh, the projection of standard bias onto this subspace is uh, isometrically uh, isomorphic to the tight frame you have started from the beginning. So these two problems coincide and uh, we will see that uh, studying the second problem is much more uh, like convenient in the sense that it gives very geometrical conditions on the maximizer of, uh, of the volume. 
So, so may I ask the same you is that yes, you can. Uh, so, am I right that the advantage is that uh, the manifold of tight frames is just less dimension? No, uh, uh, we are not talking about the manifold of the tight frames. We actually do not. What uh, if uh, it possesses the structure of uh, the manifold? We're not interested in this question. Uh, the but it clearly uh, does. Mm. Well, we can define the metric on uh, the set of tight frames, but is there a structure of manifold? What structure of manifold does it have? It's just a set of some points in highly dimensional space, which uh, satisfies several... Uh, some equation, yes, you're right. So it is a manifold. Yes. So, but it's less dimensional uh, because uh, one tight frame corresponds to many autonormal bases. Mm -hmm. Because you need well, that's interesting. to take several vectors, which are autonormal, and to augment them to form an autonormal basis. And it can be made in many ways. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the advantage of uh, the uh, of this approach with uh, tight frames is that uh, uh, they will be uh, it will be easier to perturb the tight frame uh, rather than a subspace. I will explain these words further, but uh, here you've got you have uh, a point on the manifold, and uh, it's not uh, very uh, convenient to like. Uh, to perform a perturbation of this point on the manifold, but it's convenient to uh, perturb vectors uh, on uh, the vectors in k-dimensional subspace. That's that's exactly what we will do. And uh, in this sense, uh, the second problem is uh, easier to tackle. That's what I want to say. So uh, we are cool. Are you with me? Let's go further. Uh, so uh, that's the, now is the time to explain uh, how exactly uh, we do uh, solve the problem. I will explain the approach. So uh, the only thing that we've got is actually uh, the definition of uh, of the maximal value of the function. The simple is like uh, nothing uh, very unusual. You say that uh, something is a maximizer of some function. If uh, taken any other value, uh, any other argument, uh, the value you you, uh, you get is uh, at most what you have had before. So uh, we will use this to derive the criteria of the maximizer in terms of tight frames. So uh, let me introduce again some uh, additional definitions. For a subset, uh, S tilde of RK, uh, let us define this operator, which is uh, sum of uh, square tensor product as, uh, uh, of vectors in this set. There must be tilde. It's a typo, sorry. Uh, uh, such uh, sets of uh, vectors in uh, RK uh, uh, that they span the whole space uh, will be called uh, frames. This condition that something uh, spans the whole space is equivalent that this operator introduced before uh, is positive definite. Note that uh, the frame is a tight frame if uh, this operator A uh, sub tilde N S is uh, the identity operator of uh, identity operator on RK. Uh, observation is as follows. If you've got uh, a frame, if you've been given a frame, uh, you can always make out, uh, make up a tight frame from this uh, tilde S frame. How? Uh, since uh, the operator A uh, tilde S, uh, is positive definite by definition. The square root of this operator is well defined, and uh, it will follow that uh, 
such a thing is actually tight frame. What do I mean? Uh, this this is uh, one of the things uh, I'm going to prove because its proof is rather simple. Like uh, you have got uh, a uh, just a frame, a simple frame, and uh, 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 consider uh, such an n tuple as prime, consisting of uh, vectors with uh, this operator applied to them. And uh, let us uh, compute this operator by the very definition of this operator. Uh, it follows that it is an identity operator on RK, and uh, hence uh, S prime is a tight frame. Uh, well, this uh, uh, this slide uh, actually has a very geometrical explanation of what happens. Well, namely, if you've got a frame uh, tilde S, the section that it generates, namely, namely. Uh, this thing is just a convex centrally symmetric polytope in RK. It's a polytope centrally symmetric. And uh, any centrally symmetric polytope in RK actually can be uh, represented as a, uh, in this form, clearly. Uh, what's next? As, uh, as you apply this operator, uh, you actually do something with uh, this polytope. You have, then you have the such polytope. And uh, since uh, this thing is uh, the identity operator, uh, then S prime is a tight frame. And this is uh, actually uh, literally a section of uh, of the n cube. So uh, I've just explained uh, that any central symmetric polytope in R k is an affine uh, image of uh, of section of the section of the cube of uh, some higher dimensions. That was the geometric explanation of what just happened. So let's go further. Uh, our approach is as follows. Uh, assume you've got uh, S, uh, the time frame that maximizes our problem. Actually, uh, namely, S generates the section of the maximal volume. Uh, let us do something with S. You apply some operation. To S, say you take, like, let me show. You have like n tuple v1, vn, that's your S. And you apply an operation, namely, you take vector v1 and uh, replace it with, like, say, uh, I don't know, t times v1. You have taken the vector and you have scaled them, have scaled the vector, and you thus uh, have obtained a frame S tilde. All, all other entries uh, have remained the same. The only one entries have, been ch have changed. Uh, it was scaled. Less, uh, I would say that you have performed some operation with uh, a tight frame S. Then you obtained uh, a frame. Oh, I should erase what I've just drawn, sorry. Uh, what's next? You have obtained uh, a frame tilde S, and uh, after that, you make out a, a new tight frame from the frame you obtained before. And uh, actually, now you can say something about uh, volumes of uh, this, uh, of this and this and these things. Uh, since you obtained, since you have obtained uh, the new tight frame, its uh, volume is uh, the volume of the section it generates is at most the volume of uh, of the section generated by maximizer. 
it is clear since we uh, have uh, stated that S is a maximizer of our problem. But on the other hand, uh, you may compute uh, the volume of this thing uh, in terms of tilde S. It gives you uh, the following lemma, following theorem, which is actually a criteria of the maximizer of our problem. Namely, uh, let, me, uh, let me say it once again. You have uh, a tight frame that maximizes your problem. You do something with this tight frame. You like, uh, scale vector, you map vector to the origin, you substitute some of the entries of S with other vectors, and uh, you obtain a frame. So uh, the criteria says that uh, whatever, tight, whatever frame uh, you take, uh, the following inequality holds. Are you with me? Is it all clear? Okay, let's go further. So, uh, what is the geometry behind the criteria? What what is actually what actually happens? Uh, so, here's the picture uh, that illustrates uh, my words just from the previous slides. This is your maximizing section, the section of the maximal volume. Then you do something with uh, this section, with this uh, polytope, and you obtain new polytope. Uh, you can actually uh, compare the volumes of what you had and what you derived. So uh, the left-hand side of this criteria is uh, computed in geometric terms, whereas uh, the right-hand side of this uh, inequation, of this inequality, sorry, uh, is. Uh, uh, is uh, like computing the right hand side is purely uh, algebraic problem computing of determinant and uh, and actually that's it uh, Ilya uh, answering your question from uh, so this is the machinery that we use uh, instead of uh, like uh, messing with problems uh, messing with uh, uh, points on the uh, Grassmann and manifold uh, you deal with uh, polytopes in RK. You uh, do something with uh, the central symmetric polytopes. You write expressions for their volumes, like, uh, and uh, then you make conclusions. So this is our approach. Uh, okay, let's go. Let's go on. Let me show how actually we do use the criterion. Let me show. Uh, for example, this is the frame version of uh, one of the results from the very beginning of the talk. Like say, uh, let S be a maximizer of your problem, then uh, for any vector of, uh, from S, for any entry of S, its squared uh, length is bounded uh, from above with uh, this thing and from and the lower bound is uh, as follows. Like, uh, as I said, uh, you've got to do something. Here I left uh, the, uh, the blank slide just uh, because I wanted to write something on the whiteboard. So uh, you've got the frame S, which is like say V1, Vn, and uh, I'm going to uh, perform a substitution of uh, some vector v, uh, which is that is somewhere here, with another vector u, with another vector u uh, taken from s also. Uh, so, what happens with uh, with the tight frame? You derive uh, a frame S tilde with the same entries, but uh, the, uh, the entry V is uh, substituted with uh, the vector U in some position. 
And uh, let us write the expression for this operator. What happens? Uh, actually, you have taken AS, you have subtracted V O times V and added U O times U. Namely, uh, you know that this thing here is uh, actually the identity operator on RK. So you have something like this. How do I compute its determinant? Well, actually, uh, let me write something like this. Uh, I will put this out of the of parenthesis. Let me denote this by just A. Then I have like determinant of A times identity plus A times U O times A times U. Hence, I may write something like this. Here you might uh, have told that actually uh, this operator here, it uh, can be, it may be not well defined, but since uh, I can take vector V uh, of uh, short enough, uh, I say like it's, it will be uh, enough it, if its length is strictly less than one, then the operator A is uh, positive definite, clearly. Uh, why such a vector actually uh, appears in S? Well, since uh, the, you have like definition of tight frame, you have seen that uh, this uh, sum of uh, tensor products is the identity operator. Uh, hence, it follows that the trace of uh, this operator, AS, equals that of the identity, namely K. And since uh, the entries on the diagonal of this operator are actually squared lengths of uh, my vectors, I have something like this. Note that uh, there were like n vectors, and their uh, and the sum of the squared length lengths uh, equals k. It means that there is a vector v such that v in S such that its length is at most k over n. So if, uh, if I take in this step the vector v of such length, this operator is well defined and uh, all these uh, like computations are legal. So let's go on. What do we have next? Uh, the determinant of this guy is as follows. It's like a determinant of A minus V all times V times the determinant of E plus A to the minus one over two U all times this guy. What is this? Well, I claim that it equals to one minus v square because uh, you can uh, always uh, diagonal dia, diagonal hmm. you can always make this operator diagonal uh, since like it will be the most convenient if you take the basis vector in the space like collinear with the vector v then uh, this guy 
has the only non-zero entry. This matrix has only non-zero matrix in this, uh, like the left upper angle, and the others are zero. And uh, this guy is uh, actually its squared rule, it uh, squared length of the vector v. So uh, the determinant of uh, this guy in the parentheses equals one uh, minus v to the two. Uh, as I told before, uh, the problem uh, of uh, the usage of the criteria uh, actually requires two things. It's the first thing is computing the determinant, which we have uh, just done, and uh, comparing the volumes of what you uh, had and what you have uh, after the perturbation. Clearly, uh, since uh, v, uh, v is replaced with some other vector of u, I have that this guy contains this guy. Oh, I was joking, just kidding. Mm. Sorry, I'm lagging uh, just. Uh, you have uh, the vector V and you throw it away and replace with the other vector uh, U of S. And that means that geometrically one of, uh, one of the slabs that was here, this guy's intersection of slabs, uh, the slab that, uh, was corresponding to this vector was thrown away, then clearly you have uh, the following inclusion. Of course. Well, it means that the volume of this guy is uh, at least the volume of this guy. Once again, uh, there was a vector V in uh, the tight frame S, and uh, I just throw this vector away. But how does it affect on the section that generates, that uh, S generate? Recall that uh, the section generated by a frame is the intersection of slabs. I mean, like slabs like this. You have vector V and the slab corresponding to this vector is something like this. And these two guys are intersections uh, of such a slabs. And here, one slab was just removed, thrown away. And uh, this means that uh, this uh, the section generated by S tilde has, uh, uh, how to say this in English? It didn't lose anything, like it's, it is a bigger intersection that was here. So conclusions that we have came up with are the following. I just here computed the determinant of uh, the operator S tilde. And since, uh, let me draw the rubbish from the whiteboard to free the space. Okay. And we just uh, saw that uh, the volumes, the ratio of volumes from, from before and from now on, it is uh, at least one. Because this guy is bigger than this guy. Well, it, le uh, it means that since uh, from criteria, you have that this ratio is at most one over square root of the determinant of a s tilde, we see that this guy here is at most one. Okay, so uh, what conclusions do we come up with? We see that the lengths of uh, the vector V and uh, the vector 
do, they are in some relationship. Like, let me draw this clearly. One minus v to the square, and like the same considerations leads to this expression. At uh, this product is at most one. We are all, uh, we are almost done actually. The rest is to show that how does this guy what uh, how does it uh, relate with u square? I claim that this thing is at least this thing. Well, it is clear since uh, A is the identity minus V O times V, this operator, uh, like what is uh, its geometric sense of its operator, of this operator, it uh, stretches the space in direction V with multiplier one minus V to the two. Operator A, stretches the space in the direction v so for uh, hence uh, the operator one uh, operator a to the one minus one over two it also stretches the space in the direction v but with the other multiplier but the other with the other factor so uh, the factor that uh, the space is stretched in the direction v in this case is uh, one minus uh, v to the two to the uh, minus one over two. So uh, since v is strictly less than one, as we as we saw before, this thing uh, applied to the vector u. Yes. Uh, this thing applied to the vector u. Uh, gives uh, the length bigger than U has uh, had before. So uh, finally, we came up with this inequality. And uh, the rest follows. We have just one. And uh, so, uh, the conclusion is uh, the following. I have only half an hour left. I must accelerate the speed of my talk. So, uh, uh, once again, uh, using this approach, we just uh, proven uh, the upper bound actually of uh, the squared length of vector v, namely, like it should be u in our terms from the previous slide. And uh, the, uh, exactly the same way helps us to obtain the lower bound and the, all the other conditions that will be in our way. Namely, uh, now we uh, come to the local conditions, the conditions for the local maximizer of our problem. How do I derive ones? Well, I use small perturbation of a tight frame. How do I perform one? Well, uh, instead of like discrete substitutions from the previous theorem, I will uh, consider small substitutions where the parameter t is sufficiently small. Well, after performing such a substitution, I obtain a new frame tilde s. And uh, again, uh, I'm going to, to mess with my criteria. Uh, I can treat both of the functions of uh, from the uh, from the criteria and namely this ratio and the determinant as functions of t and uh, like well uh, i will like uh, write the tailor decompositions for both of the functions of from the criteria and uh, i will compare linear parts of the decompositions namely what i want to say is that you have had, uh, let me draw once again. You had this guy here, like after performing uh, this slight perturbation, 
the volume here has changed. Namely, I can write something like delta volume of the cube generated by S. It's like the volume of what I have now minus volume of I of what I had. Uh, I can compute uh, this guy in uh, like geometric terms up to the first order of t, and for this fraction, I obtain like this uh, Taylor decomposition. On the other hand, on the other hand, I actually can compute the Taylor expansion of the determinant a tilde f uh, of the determinant of the operator a uh, tilde s up to the first term of t and uh, is something like this after that i recall the criteria namely this guy is at most one over square root of the determinant i have the Taylor decomposition for the determinant here and i have the Taylor decomposition for this guy here since uh, the uh, parameter t is sufficiently small and it lives in small uh, neighborhood of of the origin uh, and uh, since uh, for uh, like if t if the parameter t t is zero uh, the both sides of uh, this inequality coincide uh, well it just means that linear parts of uh, both these guys coincide. It's like a simple fact from the calculus uh, from the first semester. We have this thing here, and uh, it's like a framework for all the local criteria, for all the local conditions for the maximizer that we can obtain. Namely, let me show how how we use this uh, approach, like. Using this approach, we can prove that uh, <clears throat> if you have a maximizer of, of our problem, like it uh, again generates some uh, section of the cube, like it will be some kind of convex polytope, convex central symmetric polytope. It's your, it's your cube S. And recall that, as I said before, it is uh, the intersections. It is the intersection of slabs of some form, yeah. And uh, what this theorem says, it says that this slab generate uh, this slab uh, that actually cubes is uh, made of. They intersect the polytope in facets of cubes. I mean that you cannot have situation like uh, these or like there. There is no uh, slab that uh, that is like let me draw like like this, yeah. All the slabs that you have in your maximizer they intersect your section right in facets of the section. On, uh, only this uh, situation is possible. Uh, this is a rather a technical result, but uh, it helps us to think geometrically of uh, the perturbations of the polytope uh, in the following way. Uh, I remember that uh, we have that we use the perturbations of this form, and uh, they uh, naturally uh, correspond with perturbation of facets. Of the polit of uh, this section, like since uh, each slab intersects uh, my uh, section generated by S in a facet, then uh, such a perturbation actually uh, correspond to perturbation of a facet of uh, of the section. That's the geometry behind uh, the criteria. Like, let me show how we do use it. Like, we choose a facet of uh, of the of the section. I cannot see what is written. Oh, okay. Uh, I choose a facet of the section. 
and uh, I know that these guys, uh, these hyper uh, hyper planes, uh, they meet a section in a facet, but it may occur that uh, you've taken like the vector v from s you draw your polytope like this the uh, facet f let it be like this and the vector u is something like this it points in the opposite direction uh, from the facet f what's then uh, i want to to control these cases and in this case uh, I will say like that the vector v corresponds to the facet f. Like this situation may occur not only like this, like like just vector points in uh, the facet f. It may be just the opposite, like like the vector points on the opposite direction. Like uh, on these uh, cases, I want to control them. And uh, what's next? It's not very convenient to use zoom actually, let's see. Uh, let me uh, enumerate all these vectors. Uh, let D sub F be the number of such vectors just as I showed you. Uh, I don't want to draw it again. And uh, you have the following theorem, uh, the following uh, uh, necessary condition. Uh, for the uh, maximizer of of the of our problem, like uh, how it is obtained. Uh, as I said before, you took uh, like watch here. You took a facet f, and uh, some vector v corresponded to this facet f. Like let us uh, perform this substitution v goes to 1 plus t times v for sufficiently small t. And geometrically, it affects on uh, the polytope as follows. This facet f, like it moves uh, parallel itself in the small direction, say h, like for, uh, for negative t, for negative parameter t, it goes uh, in the direction of the origin. Uh, in case of uh, positive uh, parameter t, it goes in the opposite direction. So the facet of, uh, of your polytope, it, it shifts parallel itself slightly. And uh, in this case, you may compute how volume changes for both of these cases. Like up to the terms of four, first order of t, uh, the change of the volume is like the volume of this uh, dark gray prism. It's just h times volume of of the facet. Uh, on the other hand, you may you you should compute uh, the determinant of of such a substitution up to the terms of uh, first order, and uh, on the right hand side of the criteria, you will have something like like one plus these times t plus uh, o uh, of t, and uh, since uh, like again, uh, since uh, such uh, and uh, the inequality holds like this, uh, you may write. Uh, Tailor the composition for both of the sides of this inequality like this, and just uh, it means that you have something like this. Uh, that's the geometry behind the criteria, and uh, geometrically uh, it means that, like say, I promised you to tell this uh, from the very beginning from the very first slides just like uh, this uh, thing is uh, like uh, oh it's not what I wanted like this guy uh, times this yeah 
divided by k. It is the volume of such a pyramid, a pyramid over the facet with the apex in the origin. Yeah, and uh, on the other hand, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ratio of uh, such, of the volume of such a pyramid uh, to the volume of the whole polytope is like something like this. Uh, this fact is used in, uh, in the proof of uh, the planar case, so it is of great interest. And uh, let us go on. How many times left? Like 20 minutes, okay. Um, this is uh, uh, not the only uh, small perturbation that is left. Actually, you may do something like uh, this. You may substitute vector v with uh, v plus something else. Like if this something else is orthogonal to the vector v, you derive the following uh, first order necessary, necessary condition. Like uh, if you uh, make a substitution like this, like where I'm pointing at, let me emphasize that. If you perform like this substitution, it appears that your facet F is rotated around uh, a subspace of co-dimension two, like here is just a point in the planar case. Like, and as parameter T varies, uh, this uh, facet is rotated around this subspace like this or like this. And both of, in both of these cases, you, you can compute the change of volume up to the first uh, order of T. And uh, you come up with this conclusion. Like geometrically, it would mean that the vector V points into the centroid of the facet it corresponds to. Like uh, here's the definition of uh, the centroid of the body, if uh, anyone has forgotten what it is. So uh, using this uh, substitution and criteria, you derive the following lemma. It, it appears to be extremely useful in planar case since, uh, why did I close that? It appears to be extremely useful in planar case uh, since it simply means uh, that the vector v points in the middle of an edge of uh, the planar maximizer. I will show you further. So uh, now uh, the only rest of my talk is, uh, is the proof, is the sketch of the proof of uh, the main theorem of the main result, namely uh, the confirmed planar uh, case for our conjecture. So let's start. The reminder, uh, I started with uh, subspaces and uh, for two dimensional subspaces, the conjecture uh, is as follows. The tight upper bound is something like this and is attained if the section of the cube with, with the plane is just a rectangle with these slides, uh, with uh, sides of this length. In uh, frame language, it is formulated just the, just the same. Uh, so our aim is to prove this guy, it's just like the uh, if you have the maximizing uh, tight frame that lives in uh, in R two, then its area is uh, like four times the square root. Actually, uh, what we want to prove in this case, like, as I said before, the volume is attained if uh, this section is the affine cube. The only thing we've got to do is to prove that the number of edges of the maximizing uh, section generated by a tight frame, it has only four edges. Like, I denote the number of edges by two times F. And the only thing I've got to prove is to prove that F equals two. Uh, 
So uh, here, uh, the result from the from before is uh, extremely useful because uh, the previous uh, necessary condition of the first order for local maximizer means that uh, each vector v points, like let me draw the picture. You have like the polytope like this, and each vector v, it points in the middle of of the edge of cube S. Well, what it means geometrically? Well, it just means that cube S is a cyclic polygon. It, it, is, ins it is inscribed into, in uh, a circle. Well, and it means that all its vertices lie on some circle. Bam, that's cool, actually. Uh, we hope to prove uh, an analog of uh, this theorem in high dimensions, but uh, we are not very succeeded yet. Uh, however, in uh, in the planar case, it almost uh, gives us everything. So let's go further. Uh, as I said before, uh, we uh, we uh, proven we have proven uh, something like uh, these uh, bounds for square uh, length of the vector V and maximizer. But in planar case, uh, these bounds are not very convenient. Uh, they do not give like, they do not give much. And uh, in planar case, uh, such bounds uh, can be obtained with uh, no effort, with almost no effort at all. Uh, compare it with what we had and what we can uh, do actually this uh, this one instead of these uh, two actually gives a substantial improvement of uh, the bounds and instead of substituting uh, in order to derive this uh, condition for squared root or uh, for squared length of vector v instead of uh, substituting v with uh, some any other vector of a maximizer we just delete it from maximizer. Instead of considering n tuples, let us consider n minus one tuple of vectors. And uh, in planar case, uh, such a, such bounds may be obtained with this approach easily. And uh, they will be of great use actually. Let's go on and see how it helps us. How it helps us. Well, from now on, uh, I'll use S to denote the maximizer of, of my problem. Of, uh, it is maximizer of uh, the area of a section of the cube. The section of the cube then looks like, uh, like just a polygon on the plane. It's a centrally symmetrical uh, convex polygon on the plane. And I know that it is an inscribed polygon. And uh, let me denote its circumradius by R capital. Let me introduce some more notation. Edges will be denoted by f sub i, uh, vectors that point uh, into the edges will be denoted by uh, v sub i, and, and also let me introduce uh, the angle 2 times uh, phi i, which is the central uh, angle of this polytope. Uh, just namely the angle subtended by the edge fi from the origin. Then uh, from simple uh, from simplest geometry in the world, I uh, see that uh, the lengths of vector uh, of vectors from maximizer and the angles they uh, relate to each other like this. A simple geometry. Just look at the picture. <coughs> Uh, I have uh, two times f edges, like uh, namely f is the number of uh, opposite pairs of uh, edges in this polygon, and I'm and I can write uh, this sum for uh, angles. It's just exactly p over two. What's next? Uh, having obtained uh, these bounds for uh, the length of vector v, you may write the following, like since, let me draw again. Uh, 
like since you know that v to the two is at most two over one uh oh sorry like v to the two is at least uh, two to the n uh, plus one we see that v uh, one over v to the two is uh, at most one plus one n plus one to the uh, over two and uh, since all the angles of such angles they sum to p over two that there is a vector phi uh, an angle phi such that it is at at most p over two times f so it would mean that its cosine function is at least cosine of p over two times f and you have something like this having uh, this upper bound and uh, this upper bound and this expression for circumradius of uh, a section you have uh, the following upper bound for circumradius of uh, the maximizing section how it helps us well uh, now the thing that you should recall is like what we call a uh, discrete is a parametric uh, inequality. Like uh, it states the following, like see uh, the uh, section generated by the maximizer is a, is a cyclic polygon, is a cyclic central symmetric polygon. Uh, and uh, among all the inscribed polygons of given circumradius, what is the maximal area of such a polygon? The answer is uh, that is, uh, uh, is uh, an array that is the area of the regular uh, 2f gone. What I say, uh, well, again, uh, you draw your uh, circle and you inscribe like polygons in this circle with that have uh, two times f ages the polygon of the maximal area inscribed in the circle of radius r is the regular the sorry the regular polygon uh, with two times f edges uh, that leads us to the following lower bound for uh, sorry upper bound for the area of maximizer since we are dealing with uh, two times f cones, we may write the following inequality. Just it is what uh, we call discrete is a parametric inequality. Now watch my hands. Uh, since uh, square s is a maximizer of my problem, uh, and I know that there are such a tight frames that give uh, this area they were described in uh, the lemma from from the beginning of my talk uh, i have the following lower bound for the maximal area what comes next i combine these two inequalities into one and uh, I obtain uh, something very tasty in the sense that if I use uh, the uh, the bound for circumradius from this slide before, I obtain the inequality that connects uh, the number of edges of the maximizer with the dimension of, of the cube I intersect. And it is uh, almost a win because in uh, almost all the cases, it solves my problem. What I'm saying is that having uh, a big n cube and uh, you intersect uh, the n cube with two dimensional plane and you have two f gone. Uh, this number f and the dimension n should uh, satisfy this condition and uh, in dimensions, at least eight 
the only number, uh, the only positive integer f that satisfies this equation is only two. Thus, it means that in dimensions higher than eight, I've solved my planar problem. But the problems remain in the dimension lower than eight. Uh, let me uh, explain them. In dimension seven, when n equals seven, this inequality says that the only uh, legal numbers f are two and three. Well, it means that f is at most three. In dimensions six and four, since they are even, like six is divided by two and four is divided by two, our conjecture is uh, confirmed by Ball and his equality from the very first slides of my talk. So uh, what I want to say is that cases six and uh, four are done long before us and uh, However, they can be uh, done with our approach, but these are like technical issues. They are not of great interest. So, I, so we omit them. And uh, just let's, let us say that cases of, of uh, six, dimensional and six dimensional cube and four dimensional cube, they are done by Keith Ball. Uh, the only thing dimension that is left is uh, n equals five. And in this case, uh, the polygons you might you might get uh, like as it is, uh, like uh, as maximizing uh, polygons are like hexagon uh, like, uh, and uh, like again square and uh, like eight gone. Uh, the rest of the talk, the rest. Uh, four minutes I uh, I have, I will explain how we deal with these two particular cases of dimension seven and five. The dimension three is a simple exercise that you can uh, give to uh, like a strong freshman or a skilled student and he will manage to solve this problem with uh, like a plane and uh, the three-dimensional cube. So uh, the rest, uh, for case uh, n equals uh, seven, uh, we should ban, uh, well, all we want to, to do is to ban uh, three, is to ban uh, six cons as the maximizing intersections. Uh, for these values of uh, n and f, uh, the previous uh, inequality, this inequality, it turns into the equality. But uh, we remember that uh, the left hand side uh, of this inequality was actually the area of the regular. Uh, of the regular uh, polygon. It means that uh, in this case, the section, as soon as it is turned into equality, uh, it appears that uh, this uh, hexagonal section is necessarily a regular polygon. Well, since it, a regular, since it is a regular polygon, I may compute its area like, Exactly, and uh, uh, I observed that it is strictly less than the con conjectured area. And I know that there are uh, like a tight frames that uh, where the conjectured area is attained. Well, it means that we come to contradiction. And the only uh, available value of F in this case is two. And this solves uh, the problem for dimensions for dimension seven. Uh, I will not go into details uh, in uh, case n equals five. All I want to say is that, like, just uh, just a, a sketch of this case, we use the stronger version of isoparametric inequality. Like, uh, what it actually talks us. Again, you have uh, an inscribed polygon in a circle. May it be like uh, center symmetric without any loss of generality. You have these angles two phi one, two phi two, two phi three. What happens uh, if I fix one of such an angles? Well, uh, I, 
if I fix fix it one of the angles, and I still want uh, this uh, this polygon to maximize uh, its area, like still being being uh, inscribed into the circle. Uh, I make uh, these other uh, angles equal. In case uh, they are equal, I obtain the, max uh, the maximum area for such a polygon with one of the angles fixed. And I can write uh, the following inequality then. This uh, is just a ordinary discotism parametric inequality. And this is its stronger version that I just explained. Uh, it may be obtained by for, from uh, simple considerations like uh, the concavity of the scene function. <clears throat> if you are interested how to prove this. So what's next? Uh, from uh, the same reasoning as before, uh, I write uh, like this uh, upper bound for the circle radius, namely uh, this should not be uh, p over two times f. It's a typo again. Sorry, like if I replace it with some of well, namely uh, let me fix one of the angles of the maximizing sections, namely one of phi at phi sub i, and then I have the following uh, upper bound for the circum radius of the section when putting this into here gives me it gives me uh, the uh, the condition on the on the angle well using this inequality using these two inequalities i see that i have a condition for the angle uh, phi sub i and i uh, then prove that uh, this angle is necessarily uh, at most p over 4 and at least p over 10. Well, uh, next, I use one of the uh, necessary conditions of the first order derived in uh, the section when I, uh, where I told you about the local conditions. Uh, one of the conditions that uh, derives with shifting the, uh, shifting the facet is as follows. And uh, using it and uh, using these uh, bounds for the angle, uh, we uh, deal with the case n equals five. So uh, something like this, my dudes, something like this. Thank you for your attention and uh, you're welcome to ask any questions. So am I right that in the case k equaling two, you find only global maxima, but not uh, the local maximizers? Yes, uh, here we describe, uh, here we derived uh, the tight upper bound for the uh, global maximizer, <clears throat> but uh, using this uh, local criteria, uh, like uh, from, let me show it once again. Like using this criteria uh, in uh, the planar case, uh, I suspect that the only local maximizers are inscribed polygons. And uh, using like not this, but but this. Yes, we know that uh, the maximizing section is a cyclic polygon. But uh, when we proved this uh, theorem, we only used uh, the local conditions that it means that uh, not only the global maximizers are uh, are cyclic polygons and also a uh, local maximizers are cyclic polygons and uh, and using uh, like substitutions like shifting the uh, plane shifting the facet and rotating it it like all the other uh, all the other substitutions that you you might get and all the other uh, perturbations local perturbations that you might get are of uh, like it's a composition of such a, uh, of shifting and rotating 
uh, the answer is that uh, the local maximizers of the problem, of the planar problem, are cyclic polygons. Something like this. But do you know do any other local maximizers? Oh, yes, of course. Like, take uh, like uh, regular uh, hexagon. It also a local maximizer from uh, of the problem when you project uh, cross the top onto the plane. Mm -hmm. Okay, but in higher dimensions? In higher dimensions, nothing is known. Nothing is known yet. Because uh, we cannot say anything about like if the higher dimensional maximizer is in any sense a cyclic uh, uh, cyclic polytope, if there is a sphere that passes through its uh, vertices, we don't know it yet. We don't know it yet. In higher dimensions, it's complicated. I mean, in, uh, so if you take k equaling two, but take a higher dimensional q, do you know any other local maximizers? Rather than a square or what? R rather than, rather than a, a rectangle. Yes, uh, 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 it's a regular hexagon. A regular hexagon is a, a local maximizer. In any it is not global. Yes, in any dimension. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I think I may check it with almost. Well, it, it can be checked that uh, it is a local maximizer, as well as any other cyclic polygon. Okay. Any other questions, please? So, uh, like, okay. Well, but how this, no can uh, this uh, regular hexagon be achieved, say, in seven-dimensional space? So, am I right that you will have uh, that each slab, uh, each slab uh, makes so has some part of the boundary? Um, each slab, uh, yes, it intersects boundary in, in a facet, yes, and, uh, and what? And so you will get uh, three slabs on one facet and two slabs on each of the other ones, right? So is it really achievable? Something like this. Mm -hmm. So you see, you've, you've fixed three vectors. Uh, it's three equal yeah, I see what you are talking about. Uh, um, pi over three, and you yes, want it's, it, 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 it cannot be a regular. Yeah, actually, yeah, you are right. Uh, since like uh, seven is not divided by two, it is not very achievable situation. And uh, I would say not divisible by three. Not yes, not by three. Uh, and uh, this is uh, how we first shown that. Um, there are some problems, like because uh, if it is a regular hexagon, then we come to contradiction. Well, yeah, you you are right. You are right. Uh, in case uh, seven, it is not a local maximizer. Sorry, I, I'm just a bit tired after the talk. Okay, Ilya, do you have any other questions? No, thanks. Oh, okay. Quite satisfied with this. <laughs> Fine, okay, uh, maybe someone has any other questions? Well, uh, if no, uh, then, uh, then thank you for attending my talk. You've been a great public. So then, bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye.